The Croatian national football team is an interesting enigma, and one that I wanted to cover for a long time now. Croatia is a nation that only has a population of 3.8 million and a total area of 56,000, which isn't very impressive comparing to other big footballing countries. This begs the question, how is Croatia so successful at football? In this video I'll attempt to answer this question, and to do so, we have to take a look at the team's past. But before we begin, everyone does it, so I'll be the boring guy. Uh, you see the stat? This isn't actually edited, this is real. Um, please uh, subscribe, uh, well appreciated, thank you. Croatia, coming into the modern era of football, already had football heritage in their veins, as did practically every other nation in Yugoslavia, but they were clearly just a little bit ahead of them. Yugoslavia as a nation had some success at both the continental and world stage, reaching the knockout stages continuously and even placing second in the Euros on a few occasions. Now of course, Yugoslavia did consist of a few more nations than just Croatia, but Croatia definitely played a big part in it. Some of the more notable names are Robert Prasinecki, Zvonimi Broban, and of course, Davoshuk. Now of course, Yugoslavia would then go on to disband in a very peaceful and nice manner, with no one ever uh, being mad at each other. They went to war for five years. Now of course, the war did leave heavy scars on every nation involved, but Croatia would recover footballing-wise at least extremely quickly and gain some big, big results. Croatia would make their unofficial debut in a friendly against the USA before they gained recognition from FIFA and UEFA, however they still feel that a team that managed to win 2-1. They would go on to win two more unofficial friendlies against Slovenia and Romania, and an exhibition tour against Australia. Finally, in the summer of 1993, Croatia would join FIFA and be able to play real matches and enter qualifiers too. Now that was three months after the qualifiers for the 1994 World Cup had already started, so they'd have to wait for the Euro 96 qualifiers. In the meanwhile, their first official win, while recognized from FIFA and UEFA, was against Ukraine. Miroslav Blažević would then come in as coach, all while Croatia was in 125th place in the FIFA World Ranking. You should probably remember that number, it's gonna be pretty funny later on. In their first qualifying campaign ever, they would do really well, qualifying in first place ahead of Italy and all that with only one loss. They would then climb up all the way to 62nd in the FIFA World Rankings. Once the summer of 1996 rolled around, it was time for Croatia to participate in their first ever international tournament. Now, summed up short, they would win 2 out of 3 of their group stage games and progress to the knockouts, where they would get beaten 2-1 by Germany. Now, despite that, this was still largely impressive for our nation's first ever international tournament, and the fans were pleased. Then it was time to move on to bigger and better things, the qualifiers for the 1998 World Cup. In their group, they were with Greece, Denmark, Slovenia, and... Oh, oh, oh hey, look! Now, following three draws and a loss, Croatia couldn't qualify automatically, but they would still manage playoffs, in which they would face Ukraine, and manage to beat them too. Croatia are going to participate in their first ever World Cup. I wonder how that's gonna go. Croatia would open up the World Cup with a win against Jamaica, which they would follow up with another win against Japan. Then they would have to face Argentina. Now at the time of the game, they were both qualified, but Croatia did get the shorter end of the stick with a 1-0 loss. Nonetheless, their journey would still continue, and it would continue some more. Their first opponent in the round of 16 was Romania, where Davor Shukes 45th minute goal from the penalty spot would be enough to take them to the quarterfinals. Now in the quarterfinals, they would have to face a very powerful German side, one that knocked them out in the Euros in two years prior. Now winning against Romania is, you know, fairly normal, it's not that much of a shock. Germany's well, that would be a shock. That kind of result would shock the world, but the way they did it was probably even more shocking. Croatia stuffed them with three goals from Jarni, Lovic, and of course, Shuket, to manage one of the bigger upsets in World Cup history. 
Croatia by this point had already proven that they're scary and that they didn't come here just to qualify. However, they had a difficult game up against the hosts, France. In the game, Croatia would bag first in the second half, with Shuket being the one to do it. However, that joy wouldn't last too long as Turam would immediately score in the 47th and then a little while later in the 70th minute. Despite some great efforts late on, Croatia just didn't have the firepower to score and the game would end 2-1. Now it was over, the quest to win the World Cup, but they still had something more left. The third place playoff against the Netherlands. After a very tough 90 minutes, Prasinecki and Shuker's goal would be enough to bring them a 2-1 win and a podium spot to the first ever World Cup. Now it's no silver and it's definitely no gold, but for your first ever World Cup, picking up a bronze, it's acceptable. What would follow the end of the tournament was an absolute jump to third place in the FIFA World Rankings. One of the downsides to doing so well in your first ever tournament was that now you have a standard set and you have to meet it. For a while Croatia couldn't and, well, hear me out. The original plan for the video was to practically highlight every tournament Croatia were involved in, but honestly it's just kind of the same thing being repeated over and over again. Now, if, if you don't understand what I mean, hear me out, I think you'll get the point very quickly. Croatia would qualify for the 2002 World Cup, but would immediately fall out in the group stage. They'd qualify for the 2004 Euros, after a playoff win against Slovenia, but would again be eliminated from the group stage. Then they'd qualify for the 2006 World Cup undefeated and um, not win a single game and get grouped. Now, to give credit where credit is due, Slavin Bilic did make them go fairly far in the 2008 Euros to the quarterfinals, which was the first knockout stage by the way. However, that would be followed up by an absolute howler to qualify for the 2010 World Cup and then once more getting grouped in 2012. Now, maybe I am too negative, maybe I'm a bit harsh, but Croatia set standards for themselves that I think a lot of people expected them to meet. They didn't. And with another golden generation coming in, it would have been a real shame to not see them progress a little bit further in another World Cup or Euro. But it looked like they might not. However, a certain man from Livno would change all of that. After the 2016 Euros, right back Dario Serna would retire from the national team and pass on the captain's armband to Luka Modric. Now I think people often forget how big of changes these are, but this one definitely worked in favor of the team. Now the qualifiers wouldn't actually start with Dodge at the helm, they started with Ante Cacic. But he'd have a bit of a poor showing later on. A draw to Finland and a loss to Turkey and Iceland would be enough to have him sacked, but they did still make it through second place, which gave them a fighting chance. Now Dalic, with not much time, would still make it work, bagging a 4-1 win against Greece and qualifying for the 2018 World Cup in Russia. Once again, just like with every tournament, people were making predictions and the Croatians probably didn't have an image of going too far. Outsiders probably ranked them as one of the teams to fall out in the group stage, one of the most enthusiastic Croatians would have probably gone for the quarterfinals at best. Mainly because they were placed in a group with Argentina, Nigeria and Iceland, which is, like I said, fairly difficult. Those are all very tricky teams. Like I said, Nigeria are very strong and quick, Argentina just have a lot of quality on every front, and Iceland have already proven in the qualifiers that they can beat Croatia. This wasn't going to be easy. Now their first match would actually be against Nigeria and they would end up in a comfortable 2-0 win after an own goal and a penalty converted by Luka Modric. Now, way after the tournament had already ended, Zlatko Dalic in an interview said, We had already played a friendly against Senegal to practically prove to everyone that we can win against teams that play with a faster style. I mentioned this just to show off how Zlatko Dalic really had thought this through with playing both of those friendlies to practically prepare for the nations that played very similarly to them. I just want to mention it, I think a lot of people, uh, managers, definitely pick their opponents in friendlies willy-nilly, but this was very clearly calculated and smart from Dalic. In the meanwhile, Argentina had drawn to Iceland 1-1. Next up was Argentina, and this match was gonna be difficult. By all logic, Argentina had a much better squad, however the draw to Iceland earlier definitely boosted Croatia that bit more. And not to mention that if they were to win this game, 
they would already qualify to the knockout stages. However, that wasn't going to happen. First half would end in nil, and then Argentina's goalkeeper would have an absolute nightmare as he practically set up Ante Rebic for the first goal of the game. Luka Marsch then said, yeah, nah, fuck it, goal, and just scored from like 30 yards out with an absolute wonder strike that would practically solidify their win. Then they'd just score a third. They didn't have to, but they just kind of like walked it in because they were kind of let walk it in. I mean, this defending is absolutely atrocious. And just to add to the misery, they almost scored from a free kick a little bit earlier. Croatia had already qualified for the knockout stage, while Argentina's hopes hanged by a thread. Now, like I mentioned, they already had a game in hand against Iceland, who at that point had some hope of qualification, but Argentina would win against Nigeria, so it wouldn't matter one bit. Despite that, this team would just not allow themselves to lose, as they would still win 2-1 with a late goal from Ivan Perisic that would guarantee 9 points and progression to the group in first place. Argentina would also make it through. Now Croatia's sights were set on the round of 16 matchup against Denmark. Denmark would take the lead early, really early, like, like first minute kind of early. Now this probably shook Croatia up a bit to like remember that the game has indeed started and only 3 minutes later they would reply with the goal from Mario Mandzukic. Now this game did threaten to be a goal fest, it, it, it wasn't, no goals would be scored after that for 90 minutes and then a further 30. However, late on, a penalty was given to Croatia after a pretty rough foul on a Croatian player who was through on goal, and Modric took it. To most people's shock, he missed. With the score being level following that, the teams went to a penalty shootout. Going into it, Suvasic's wrist was uh, to simply put fucked, and by all accounts, Croatia should have lost. They pulled through, with Ivan Rakitic scoring the decisive penalty, and for the first time in the last 20 years, Croatia made it to the quarterfinals of the FIFA World Cup. Although they were happy and probably extremely pleased to have finally broken that apparent curse, there was still more to be done. They had the quarterfinals to win. To the surprise of practically everyone, Russia somehow beat Spain and qualified to the quarterfinals, making them opponents for Croatia. Now this probably gave Croatia and I guess Russia on a level a bit more hope that they could beat the other opponent. Because I mean it's easier to face Russia surely than Spain. Now I would recommend you go watch the highlights of this game or even like the full game somewhere because I could never do it justice. This was one of the craziest matches of the World Cup and potentially one of the crazier in the entire history of the tournament. And like I said, I'm aware I could never do it justice, I will still attempt to. After 31 minutes, Cherchev gives the host the lead and the stadium explodes. However, that wouldn't last for too long as in the 39th minute, Andrei Kramaric would level the playing field. Then no more goals would be scored in those 90 minutes and then came extra time, which in the 101st minute, Vita's header from a corner was enough to get Croatia in the lead. Croatia defended that lead ferociously. However, to most people's surprise, just when it looked to be over, right back Fernandez bags in the 115th minute of the match. This would equalize the game and if no more shocks were to happen, it would send them to penalties. And no more shocks happened and they went to penalties. Now as you'd probably expect, the penalties were an extremely tough watch for both sets of fans, but it would be Croatia that would go on to win through another Ivan Rakitic penalty. Croatia had just won their quarterfinal match and were already set for the semi-finals. They had already met their greatest success in 1998. What was left was to beat it. Now, most people noticed the pattern. Croatia would play against a team that's on the level. They would mainly struggle and would manage to play out a draw and would then win on penalties. But surely against such a side like England, they couldn't do it. Most sides would be satisfied with that, but Croatia really wanted to beat their ever best success and try to gain at least second place if not win the entire tournament. And England was in their way. Croatia didn't make it very easy for themselves as once again they'd have to play out from the back after conceding an early goal to Kieran Trippier. The free kick, despite being beautiful, broke hearts of a nation and practically fueled another ones. But one good thing about conceding early is that you will have time to make a comeback. And make a comeback, Croatia did. 
A scrappy goal and on the 68th minute from Ivan Perisic, assisted by Vrstalico from a beautiful cross, would be enough to equalize the game once more. Once again, Croatia were back. Now it did look like the same story was to follow, Croatia running it down to penalties, because extra time did begin and they didn't score, at least not very quickly, up until the 109th minute when things would change. Magikic crept up behind Stones to bag a 109th minute incredible winner assisted by Ivan Perisic to send the entire stadium wild. Now England, they couldn't believe it and even attempted to try and score while they were celebrating, however, it wouldn't work. Croatia would pull through for the last few minutes and would end up winning their semi-final bout, sending themselves to the finals and making their best success at a World Cup ever. Once again, an extreme upset and one of absolutely incredible proportions that had the world on streams. Then they would have to face France, and once again, just like in most matches, they were the underdogs. Pretty weirdly poetic that this was set up. The team that 20 years ago stopped them from getting to a final, they would now have to play in the final. Now a very entertaining and goal-filled final was fairly one-sided and a proper shame for Croatia. The fairy tale just couldn't happen, following a Mario Mandzukic own goal, Antoine Griezmann penalty, Pogba's wonder strike and killing Mbappe's goal, it was 4-2, and France had won the World Cup. Now yeah, Croatia did bag through Ivan Perisic and Mandzukic, and even gave themselves a fighting chance with that Ivan Perisic goal, however it was one-sided, and everyone could tell. Although extremely disappointing, Croatia couldn't have been too upset with their defeat as they had gone much further than anyone expected and have finally picked up silver. As of then, they practically had a ratio of picking up a medal further and further every 20 years, so they will probably win the entire World Cup by 2048. Now, jokes aside, this would help Modric win both the Ballon d'Or and of course the Golden Ball at the World Cup. This team had a high ceiling and one that they were going to have to hit. There was still more to do, and hopefully they can do even better in the next World Cup. So, editing this right now, I realize I forgot to make my coverage of the 2020 Euros and the 2022 World Cup good, so that will come out in a separate video because I refuse to put out this half-baked garbage. Uh, I don't know when it will come out, hopefully before February, uh, but knowing me, you'll probably see it in May. Thank you all for watching, I'm sleep deprived, I'm gonna go to bed, good night.